Oh, have we started? Yes, Bella. The camera's recording. Can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, of course. Hello. My name is Bella Bird and you can call me BB. I'll be working with the younger children for this workshop. So every time you see me, we'll be having a lot of fun together. Although sometimes we might need some help from some of the older people with the activities. I'm going to be working with my friend, Monsieur Felix Fox. Felix! Felix, where are you? Felix! <gasps> Bonjour, je m'appelle Felix Fox. Hi Felix, uh, if we can call Bella Bird BB, can we call you Fifi? Hmm, I suppose so, yes, if you must, seeing as this is a workshop also for the children. Oh, the things I have to put up with. Oh. Uh, anyway, I am going to be working with the older children and also with the adults. But it is not only Bella Bird who will be having all the fun. Oh, no, 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 no. We will also have lots of fun. But if the explanations, they get a little bit, uh, how shall we say, boring, for the younger ones is no problem. You can go away and come back when Bella Bird will call you back. Okay, uh, before we start, I think I need to introduce the third member of our team. Uh, Marie, Marie, where are you? Hello, my name's Marie and I will be giving Felix and Bella a hand, literally, to present this workshop on how to tell stories with puppets. The workshop is actually quite long, so don't feel you need to look at it all in one go. You can fast forward through the bits you're less interested in, or come back to it another time. Okay, so uh, who wants to start first? Oh, me, 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 me! Um, Bella, before we make puppets, I think we should try and tell people what puppets actually are. Do you know what a puppet is? Well, I'm a puppet. And you use your hand to make my mouth work. So maybe a puppet is something that you move with your hand. Okay, that's, uh, that's not bad. That's pretty good to explain what a puppet is. We've got some different types of puppets here. Okay, we have, do you know what this is? Oh yes, that's a sock puppet. Yes, a very simple puppet, a little bit like you. If I put my hand inside, can you help me please, Bella? Oh, thank you, yes. It's the challenge of doing a puppet workshop on your own. You need a bit of help, thanks, Bella. So, a sock puppet is a bit like you. I've got my hand inside to make it work, okay. Um, what about these others? <laughs> Thank you, Bella. Okay, this isn't a hand or a sock puppet. This is a, do you know? Yeah, it's a finger puppet. This is a llama. It's a type of animal from Peru, and that's where this comes from. So can you please help me again, Bella? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. No, you're not really eating the llama. You're just helping me. So... A puppet is something that a human can help move. Okay, should we keep going? Yeah? Yes, this is very interesting. Good. So what about this? This is just a kind of a little soft toy. Actually, it looks like a key ring uh, that I found. Is this a puppet? Well, no, because it's not moving. That's right, like this. It's just a soft toy or a key ring, yeah? Yes. But as soon as I make it move like this, so we make it walk towards the camera, there we go, then it becomes a puppet. Oh, a puppet is something that we as humans can make move. So any of your soft toys, anything at all, even an old sock can become a puppet, but it needs a human to help make that happen. So, so far we've seen hand puppets, glove puppets, finger puppets, 
uh, key ring puppets. I just made that one up. And uh, do you recognize this? This is a special type of puppet. Yeah, yeah, this is a string puppet, sometimes known as a marionette. Yeah, but you see, I'm still making it move. That's what a puppet is, something that we make move and then it has a character. It has a personality, like you become Bella Bird. And Felix, wherever he's gone, he becomes Felix Fox. So puppets come in all different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they're really, really big as well, with a whole person inside. Okay, great. Yes, now can we make some puppets, please? Yes, now we can make some puppets. So here we're going to make some puppets with objects that we're finding. So I found this at my friend's house. I'm going to use this with a scarf or a shawl, uh, which I have here, or any piece of material. Uh, I'm right-handed, so I want to use my right arm for the movement of the puppet. So I'm going to hold this in my left hand, but I'm going to cover my hand with the shawl, like that. I'm going to hold the head, take the scarf all the way around, and then I'm going to hook the material at the top of the head, just like that. Oops. There we go. And then I'm going to use my arm here to become the arm of the puppet. So you might need to adjust the material so that we're not hiding the face too much like this. Now you can either just use it like this as an interactive discussion with the puppet. Hello, how are you? Good, excellent, yeah. Um, so I'm not hiding myself here. You can see that my arm is providing some movement for the puppet, but I can also try and hide myself under the table so that we're just left with the illusion that the, the puppet is, um, is speaking on their own. So if I hide under the table, we end up with something like this. Hello children, welcome to my wonderful world of puppets. I like this puppet, but not everybody has these kind of things around the house. Let's try the same puppet, but let's make it ourselves this time. All you need is some cardboard, scissors, pencil, bit of glue maybe. You ready? Yes! Okay, now if it gets too hard, just ask for help, okay? Okay! So I have a cereal box that I've uh, opened out. I'm going to take a pencil and on one side, about halfway plus a couple of centimeters to the left, so about there. So it's not quite halfway. I'm going to draw a curve from here down to here. Okay, just a kind of an approximate curve. Doesn't have to be too exact. And then I'm going to fold this over and cut along that curve. Yes, you can start to see how we're going to have our face. Now we're going to draw in some eyes. If you like drawing, then you can just draw them in. I would put them a bit low down, not too high up, otherwise they might get covered by the cloth. But uh, if you don't like drawing so much, then no problem. First of all, I'm going to take a bigger plate and I'm going to draw in an eyebrow. Then for the actual eye, I'm going to take something that is a smaller circle. There we go. And just draw around that. And when I draw in eyes, I like to give a, a little bit of a light, a circle of light. 
gives them a bit more life. And then I'm just going to colour in the middle of the eyes, black. And you can decorate the whole of the rest of the face. So you could paint it or stick things on it. You could even give it some hair with some wool, bits of thread, anything you want. The important thing is this is your puppet. So it doesn't matter what mine looks like, you're going to create your own. And it's going to be lovely. Uh, I think I want my eyebrows a bit darker, so I'm just going to go over them again with my plate. So here we already have most of our face. Um, if you want, you could give it a bit more uh, volume by creating a nose that sticks out. So this is fine if you like that, you can just leave it like that. If not, if you want to go a bit further, it's a little bit more difficult. But I'm going to draw in on one side a nose, so this is still the centre of our face. What I'm going to do is cut this line here, but I'm not cutting the whole thing out. I want it to still be attached to the cardboard there. So I will make a little snip, not too much, just enough that I can get my scissors in. And then this is a bit tricky. Might need to ask someone a bit older to help with this. So you can see we've now got a bit of a profile here for the nose. And I'm going to leave these top bits from the cereal box for the moment because when we fold this, I think these might be useful that we can maybe stick them like that and that will help us to get the three dimensions of our face. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do that now. Okay, and you can brightly decorate it, make it fabulous. If you're bothered by the, the colour that shows through from the other side of the cereal box, it doesn't matter, um, just paste uh, some plain paper on the back, no problem. Right, let's get the cloth. So as we did before, I'm holding the puppet in my left hand. I've uh, put the cloth over the top so it's uh, just catching at the front. I've got my arm under and here's my puppet that I made myself. Don't worry, it does take time so do practice in front of a mirror um, with the cloth and arranging it properly and do help the younger ones. Oh, sorry, duck. Uh, I think you're on the wrong puppet show. I think you need the one uh, down the corridor, uh, first door on the left. Um, yep, sorry about that. We are in the middle of filming here. No, that's fine. No problem. Okay, see you later in the dressing room. Bye. Can you show me the one where you don't even need the cardboard? Yes, of course I can, BB. It's very simple. All you need for this one is a pen and again, a scarf, piece of cloth. I like to write with my right hand. So this time the puppet is gonna be my left hand here. So I have a pen to make sure it's not permanent. Well, first of all, I'm gonna make a fist like this. I'm gonna curl my thumb under and then curl my fingers like this. And I'm going to draw two eyes, one on either side. So with my piece of cloth, I'm going to hold near the end here with my fingers like that. I'm going to 
wrap it round. Hello, nice to meet you. I love Act Together. Building partnership between different generations for a just and sustainable world. I'm even wearing the Act Together purple logo colour. Great. Thanks for that bit of branding. I want to practice again, please, using the scarf. Okay, no problem. I know it can be a bit complicated sometimes and you do need practice to get it right. So this time I found a broken toy. Here it is. It's a wooden head uh, on a stick, some kind of sheep or cow. And there's also a broken foot that goes with it. Now, it's important that you don't go around breaking people's toys in order to do this. Uh, the idea is that you're recycling things that are already broken. You could do this with um, broken dolls, uh, although do be careful because broken dolls can actually be pretty scary. Um, yeah, you get scared by broken doll heads. Yeah, me too. Same principle as before. Uh, I'm gonna hold the head in my left hand because I'm right-handed and I want that arm to move. I've got my scarf. I'm gonna get this end of the scarf and hold the head like this. You can see my hand is covered. I'm gonna bring the length of the scarf around. There you go. And I'm going to hide my arm as much as possible under the scarf. And this time the only difference is that I'm going to hold with my right hand the foot. Now, in order to get a good motion of the arm, I'm going to put my wrist against the back of my other hand and I'm going to imagine it's glued there so it can't come away like that, otherwise it might look a bit strange. So we imagine this is the sheep's arm and it stays there. That's quite cute. I quite like this one. Yeah, yeah, you're quite cute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. Okay, how do you feel, Bella? Are you getting a bit tired of making puppets yet? No, not yet. Okay, so we do just a few more and then we'll move on to something else. Maybe go and see how Fifi, our friend Felix Fox, is doing. Okay. So far we've looked at making puppets with a piece of cloth and one last one for this is uh, using a bottle, an old bottle, to recycle. Uh, we don't like single-use plastic so let's give it a second use. Uh, the lid is still on and we're just going to put some eyes on. If you've got um, stickers you could use those directly otherwise just an old piece of paper again recycled and stuck on. And here we have the makings of another puppet. Very very easy. Right, I need uh, Felix for this next bit. Uh, Felix! Felix! I am so sorry. I think Felix has gone to the bathroom with his microphone turned on. I do apologise. He drank a lot of tea earlier on. A lot of tea. Let's just cut here and come back when he's ready. So Felix, welcome back. Uh, you and I have had a little chat uh, about appropriate behaviour when filming, so uh, I do hope we're not going to have this, uh, this type of thing happen again, okay? Yes, I am very sorry. It will not happen again. Please forgive me. Okay, no worries. That's fine. That's what we're here for, is to learn um, and to, to get better and better yeah, at doing things. Um, we're going to talk about why puppets are so great now. Why do we like them so much? Why are they so useful? Well, I'm very glad you asked me this. I think there are two reasons in particular why uh, puppets are so great for uh, communicating, especially between uh, adults and uh, children. Ah, okay. So, um, Felix, what's the first reason? It is because they are good at both entertaining, da, 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 
Yes, I can sing, I can dance, I can tell jokes. But as well as being fun and entertaining, they are also very good at communicating good, strong messages. So we call this uh, the cross between the entertainment and the education. And sometimes we call this edutainment. Bah, c'est difficile à dire. Yes, it's difficult to say, yes, with a French accent, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so edutainment, yes, I've heard. Um, Okay, so that's one reason uh, we can get people's attention, yeah, especially when they're laughing and having fun. Um, and uh, what's the, the second reason? Uh, the second reason is because it helps us with puppets to talk about things which are a little bit more sensitive or difficult to talk about if it was talking just between people. Ah, that's very interesting, Felix. Could you give me an example of that? Well, of course I can, but I need a little help from some of my other puppet friends here. I think I would like to set up a little problem between Monsieur Seguin here on my right and then the dog that we will pretend is a wolf here on my left. You know, in Europe in particular, and in North America, we have a strong tradition of the fairy tales where the, the wolf is, uh, is the, the, the body and uh, has a problem with the humans. So we will work with this tradition. Okay? Okay, that's fine. Um, do you want to uh, maybe sit this one out while I work with the other puppets? Okay, yes, that is a very good idea. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, uh, bye then. Okay. <gasps> Felix, I thought we talked about this. Sorry. So dealing with uh, sensitive uh, topics, uh, this here will be our wolf. Okay. It's actually a husky dog, I think. And this here, this is uh, Monsieur Seguin from uh, a traditional uh, old French uh, story, which we'll come back to later. Uh, and we could set up a problem, a sensitive problem, whereby the wolf, that's me, ha ha ha, uh, is going to try and do something bad, maybe, to Monsieur Seguin. And it might be difficult for us to talk about this uh, directly, maybe something the bad thing that the wolf wants to do um, in terms of maybe violence, this can be very sensitive. But if we make a carefully crafted story using the wolf, that's me, and Monsieur Seguin, that is me, my voice sounds very similar to uh, Felix Fox. <laughs> uh, yes, sorry about that. Um, you do the best you can with the resources available. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, we could talk about sensitive issues like violence by doing it through puppets and it's less confrontational, okay? So yes, Monsieur Seguin looks like a, a human, looks like a person, but at the same time, he doesn't look like a person. You can see by the way that he moves that he's not a real person, but he's like a person. So this gives us a bit of distance to uh, talk about difficult things. Now for this workshop, um, and this is a, a Felix Fox section, so this is for the, for the older children and the adults, I'm using violence as an example, but um, it could also be talking about sensitive things around um, things to do with, uh, with sex and uh, uh, things that we get a bit embarrassed to talk about, and uh, this can really help because it gives us a distance and as Felix said earlier, we can do it also with humour and comedy carefully mixed in. So we want to watch because it's fun. Yep, you can be fun. Um, as well as being scary as well. Um, and we can work carefully with this. So this is why puppets are so great. They are entertaining, but we can also talk about serious messages but in a way that's going to be memorable in a way that they might not listen if it was just um, humans talking to each other or even actors on a stage because uh, we, we bring all sorts of our own ideas to those kinds of conversations but the puppets allow us with a bit of creativity to free up our imaginations and maybe accept things that we might not accept 
otherwise. Okay, so far? Yep. Okay, great. Um, sorry, what was that? You want some more entertainment now? That was all too serious? Okay, that's fine. Let me just put down Monsieur Seguin. There we go. Just have a little sleep. And, um, okay, yeah, singing and dancing, very important in the puppet tradition. Uh, yeah, I know you're dying to burst into song there on my left. Let me entertain you. Let me make you smile. Okay. So singing, dancing, great, not just for children, but also for adults as well. Very great long traditions in many, many cultures of making this work in fantastic ways to convey traditional stories and also new messages. Uh, time to bring back Felix, I think. I am here, yes. It is me with the same voice as Monsieur Seguin. <laughs> what do we do now? That is an excellent question, Felix. I actually have no idea and I need to go and look at my notes. Okay? Okay, that is fine. I can be patient. Hello, come back. It's Bibi here. Time to make some more puppets. Thank you, Bibi. We're now going to make some very simple puppets. And I got this idea from the wonderful Moth Physical Theatre uh, in the UK. So I highly recommend that you uh, look at them online. This is based on the Japanese traditional style puppetry called Bunraku. So all we need is two sheets of paper. I'm using old newspaper. So when the Moth Physical Theatre do it, they do it much bigger because traditionally these puppets are about half life size. But I only have some smaller pieces of paper, so we will try this anyway. Take one piece of paper, very simple. Scrunch it up. I like to twist it as well. Okay. And then do the same with the other one. We're going to do the same thing with both pieces. So fold it in half and then about a quarter of the way round we are going to use a bit of tape to secure it. Okay, so again fold in half and then piece of tape around the middle. It's going to make those a bit tighter. Very easy. This is going to be the head and the arms and then do exactly the same with the second piece. Now this traditional style of uh, Japanese puppetry requires three people to work these puppets together and they're the larger size. I don't have two other people with me right now so I'm just giving you an idea of this but I do recommend that you look at this further because it's a lot of fun. You could have a really good uh, time with uh, adults and children working together with these because you need real teamwork. Okay, so these are the legs, so I'm just going to bend in halfway down some knees and some feet. Okay, and this side as well. Very simple. And let's attach the head and the body together. I love this, it's so simple. And yet the puppet becomes very expressive. That means that you can really get an idea of what the, the puppet is trying to show with their emotions. I'm going to put in some elbows and some hands. Tighten that one. I'm going to have this elbow going down. There we go. So this is our Bunraku style puppet and you can check online if you have a larger version how you use uh, more people to make it move with the, the feet and the arms 
Oh. And the head. Let's make it dance a bit. Oh, 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 please, please. Can we make a sock puppet? I love sock puppets. No problem, Bibi. Easy to make a sock puppet. What you need is, no prizes for guessing, an old sock. Again, make sure you have permission before you turn this into a puppet. The easiest thing is to put some eyes on and you could sew on some buttons. I'm going to use the eyes that we made earlier from our bottle just to save time. There we go. And you could use some wool to make some hair and you can decorate it in all sorts of ways. So very, very easy to make a sock puppet. Other puppets that are very easy to make are finger puppets. Uh, so here are some examples of some that I have already. This one I rescued from someone who was going to throw him away. And this one is knitted, part of a series of knitted animals from Peru. A little duck. Okay. You can either have them vertical or horizontal. Lots of inspiration on the internet. If you like knitting and doing crafts, there's some very simple ideas that you can use. Uh, we will just do one or two here. Okay, uh, let's make a mouse. So one circle, another circle slightly overlapping, two ears and then I'm going to cut it out. So our basic mouse shape, let's make some holes at the bottom where we're going to put our fingers through. So I just have a coin and to draw around. So two circles, help cutting them out. Then I'm going to decorate my mouse. So I think I'm going to add in some more detail in the ears. And let's give it a little nose, some whiskers. And I think my mouth is going to have some little teeth as well. And of course you could spend much longer on this, have much more fun, much more colours. You could uh, add in uh, some pipe cleaners or some grass or straw to make the whiskers. And of course you can add a tail with anything that you have around. We have a little mouse. And there are lots and lots of versions of these that you can find online. Very, very simple to do using two fingers or more than two fingers. I saw online a reindeer template that I quite liked. So I'm going to quickly do that one as well. And thank you, Piton, uh, one of my cats who is assisting me here today. Goodbye. <laughs> I just did that very quickly, uh, but it's just a, a very simple shape. I'm just reusing our cardboard box again. I'm going to cut that one out. I'm going to do the same thing again, putting uh, two legs in at the bottom using my coin. Again, be very careful when using scissors. That goes for you as well, adults. Majority of accidents happen within the home. Little tip when cutting circles, I find it easier to turn the cardboard rather than trying to turn the scissors. And so here we almost have a reindeer, but oh, hang on a minute, there's something missing for our reindeer. Yes, we need antlers. Look at this, cute little antlers. 
As I said, there are lots of others that you can find online. And one last one. Uh, I just uh, found this uh, piece of card, which is already shaped a bit like that. Uh, so I think I will try and make this into a sheep, maybe using all of my fingers. So I have the beginnings of my sheep with my legs, little legs. I think it needs some kind of head. I just made a circle and I've just cut some bits out and uh, put an ear on it. Let's see how that looks. And just stick that on the back. You could spend a lot more time over this, make it much more pretty, but I'm just trying to give you an idea of what's possible. Okay, so we start to have uh, a bit more of a fat sheep there. You could add a little tail. Be inspired, create your own shapes and uh, creatures as well. One more variation on our finger puppets. You can use the inside of a toilet roll or one of the longer ones that come with the kitchen roll, for example. And I think we will make a frog. So first of all, I'm going to just cut down one side. And this will allow me to put my fingers into it. And then same as we did before, I think I want uh, just two fingers here. And remember, depending on the size of the fingers that are going into these holes, you might want to adapt. So my fingers are bigger than a child's fingers might be. And cut those out quickly. That's going to be my feet and I think for the frog eyes we can mm -hmm. let's try this make some pop-up eyes so I'm going to draw just halfway maybe a bit more around the coin so not all the way around just about halfway and then I'm going to cut them. Again, you're going to need help with this. because so you don't want to cut the whole thing just along the curved lines. And then I'm going to fold these eyes forward a bit. And I'm just going to make them look like eyes. And now I think he just needs a nose of some sort. I'm going to colour him a little bit green so we know that it's a frog. Could use some paint for this. Again, you can take much longer over this and make something really, really great. Remember, always put your lid back on your pens to stop them from drying out. Anyway, there we go. So there we have a frog to go with our collection. This is more three-dimensional. Uh, okay, Felix, I would now like to talk about the power of puppets. Oh yes, I have a lot of power, like a superhero. Um, Actually, that's not really what I was talking about. The power of puppets. By this, I mean that there are some things that we have to be careful about when we are using puppets. Aurélie, this sounds uh, very interesting. Yes, uh, please tell me more. Okay, Felix. Well, the first thing I want to talk about is when puppets represent real stories or real people. Okay, we have to be careful here. For example, uh, you are Felix Fox and I made up your character that you are a little bit naughty uh, with this uh, silly French accent because we're here in France 
Um, but you do not represent a real person, okay? There is not a real Felix Fox. And I am not making fun of a real Felix Fox by um, giving you this character. Okay. If, however, I would create a puppet that I named after my neighbour or somebody that I knew that I maybe didn't like so much and I started to make fun of them and I started to tell a story where um, they do something silly or stupid or bad, then this is just not very kind, it's not very nice. So with the stories and the names and the, the characters of your puppets, just be careful and be kind. Now, you might think, for example, well, hang on a minute, hang on, Mari, there is a strong tradition of satire in puppets. And you would be right. For example, I'm from the UK, and uh, when I was growing up, there was a very famous uh, puppet-based TV program called Spitting Image, which deliberately made fun of well-known politicians and figures um, using uh, puppets. So it was deliberately intended that those puppets would represent particular people, and they made fun of them. So this is called a satire and it was uh, done um, to make people think about the politics um, as well as entertaining. However, this is not really uh, what we're intending to do. We're trying to get adults and children to work better together, so we want to be conveying positive messages about that. Now, we can sometimes have uh, humour, which is uh, a little bit cheeky, uh, hence uh, Felix uh, going to the bathroom and yeah, doing all sorts of other things. Yeah, 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 I'm looking at you right now. Yeah, yeah, you. Uh, we can be a bit cheeky, uh, but we don't want to be cruel. So be very careful naming and giving characteristics to your puppets. The same if you want to tell a story which is about yourself. You just need to be careful. How much do you want to communicate to others about your personal story? Um, and is there a way that you could change the story so it has the same messages that you want to get across but using different characters with different names, different settings and things, just to protect yourself a little better, okay? Yes, uh, it's very interesting indeed. Uh, I like this uh, idea that I am not based on somebody real, that I am my own unique creation. Oh, it makes me feel very special. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Felix. Okay, let's move on to the uh, next Thing I want to talk about. So number one was about representations of people and stories, be careful. Number two is about stereotypes. Do you know what a stereotype is, Felix? Yes, I do, because I am a well-educated uh, fox, and a stereotype is something that lots and lots of people uh, think is true, but it is, uh, how you say, uh, oversimplified. Uh, or I might say that uh, something to do with the gender, that all of the, the women should uh, stay at home and look after the children while the men go off and uh, earn the money. These are the stereotypes. So it can be a bit tricky to get a balance between tapping into something that people recognize, uh, but also turning the tables and changing stereotypes. Now you might do it that you have a twist in your tail deliberately at the end so that you flip around what people might be thinking. Wolves are not evil, wolves are wolves. So if we were redoing our story of Monsieur Seguin and the wolf, then we could change it at the end with a twist in the tail so that the wolf actually helps Monsieur Seguin in, in some way. And we can do this um, to change ideas and attitudes about the roles of children and adults, for example. So this workshop is being done in the context of uh, ACT Together, which is about uh, children and adults playing, living, working together for a better world. So what is it that people hold as stereotypes or simplified ideas about both adults and children? And how can we use puppets to recognize that a little bit, but to, to overcome it? So this is not so easy sometimes in practice. And in many kind of fairy stories, we have these stereotypes that disability is associated with being bad or being evil. So for example, there may often be a witch who lives in the forest 
again in many, many European type fairy tales, um, and the witch is evil and the witch might um, walk strangely or have a hunchback or some physical difference that makes her in the tradition evil and bad. Of course we don't want to be associating any kind of physical difference with something that's bad. So let's break away from that. So I want to respect the history of puppeteering, storytelling, fairy tales, because these are really, really powerful ways to communicate with people that have been passed down through the ages. But let's make it work for us. Let's keep what works well, but change some of these stereotyped uh, stories. Wow, you talked a lot there. You really did. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Is it my turn now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Felix. I did go on a bit there. Can you tell me a little bit more about Monsieur Seguin and uh, Blanquette uh, there? Uh, could you just go and, uh, I would say go and get another cup of tea, but we know what happens when you do that. So if you could just go and amuse yourself for a minute uh, while I uh, show Monsieur Seguin and his goat. So this is a 19th century French story by Alphonse Daudet and um, I have to say it is, uh, like many children's stories, actually pretty blooming miserable, okay? Uh, so what happens is Monsieur Seguin here, yeah, have a little dance, thank you very much. He has had, I think, six goats that have all gone off and um, wanted to live in the wilderness in the mountainside and they've all been eaten by a wolf. The seventh goat, the beautiful La Blanquette, um, she uh, is the last of the goats to <laughs> essentially die a horrific, horrible death at the hands of a wolf. There's a little bit in between. Um, I personally <laughs> fail to see any redeeming factors in this story. It's all just very, very depressing. Uh, so what I could do is, if I were doing a puppet show in France, however, I could still use Monsieur Seguin and Blanquette because the story is so well known and it's part of the culture. I could use them, but I could retell the story. I could change it. Yeah, if I was trying to do um, a puppet show about Act Together, I could maybe have Monsieur Seguin as the older character and uh, Blanquette uh, could be a younger character, but we could change it so that Blanquette actually becomes the heroine of the story. Uh, so it taps into the culture and the tradition and things that people recognise. They say, oh yeah, it's Monsieur Seguin. At the same time, we actually change people's ideas. So basically, Monsieur Seguin and Blanquette would actually live happily ever after at the end, and then they would go off into the sunset. There we go. Now in some traditions you would have to be careful because puppetry in some cultures is very strongly uh, linked to telling religious stories or very very traditional stories with a culture of puppeteering that has been passed down through centuries um, and there you have to be careful because people can get upset if you start changing the stories uh, but um, I do encourage you still to be creative in as many ways as possible. Should we bring back Felix? Felix! Yes! Here I am! Okay, okay Felix, um, we talked about be careful about representations of real people yeah, and uh, real stories. Mm -hmm. We said be, be careful and be kind. And we said be careful about stereotypes, yeah, that uh, not, all, not all, all wolves are evil um, and not all women or girls act in a certain way and so on and ways to, to kind of flip that around whilst also tapping into to cultural traditions and things. Um, then I started to talk a little bit about disability. I think it's a shame uh, in the past that uh, disability, physical disability, uh, intellectual disability has been associated with the kind of the, the baddie characters in lots of stories um, intended to, to scare people. Uh, so we certainly don't want to be doing that. Um, but I wanted to talk a bit more in terms of the power of puppets uh, in relation to people with disabilities when they are in the audience, first of all. Now, we have been having fun um, and I've created these characters, Bella Bird and Felix Fox, to help us explain about puppeteering, and the power of puppets, and the magic of puppets. But just to warn you, with an audience with um, children or adults with some types of intellectual disabilities, 
there can be a problem that um, this, uh, this person might uh, what we call over-identify with a puppet. So what we mean by this is we have created this magical world with our imaginations where part of your brain watching this kind of is listening to Felix and interested to see what he's going to do next. Um, and part of you thinks of him as being a real character and the other part of you realises, however, that, look, he's actually just a puppet. He's a piece of cloth and a piece of cardboard and a stick, OK? Uh, it's only when I, as the human, interact with him that he becomes the character. Some people struggle to understand that difference and if I put Felix down or if I, for example, threw him somewhere, then some people might get very upset. Oh, you're hurting Felix, thinking that Felix is alive, um, that Felix really is uh, a fox and so on. So if you're working with these specific groups of people, just um, a few things that you can do. One is to do what I'm doing now, which is to show Felix is not Felix. Felix is not a puppet until I move him. Okay, Felix only exists with me. He does not exist on his own. Uh, Felix uh, is not real, like feel him, yeah, feel him. You can feel the rod going down the middle, the texture of his fur. He's not real. Uh, and I could also distance myself from him as well. And I could deliberately show my arm and how I am moving him, yeah. So Felix actually has a little hole in the back and I can make him a glove puppet as well. Um, and working with certain types of children and adults, I might need to show very deliberately that Felix is just a piece of cloth, but we are pretending that he is a character, okay. Uh, so that's just a, a quick sensitivity about that so that people don't get upset. Um, and just to make the point, I'll do the same thing. I'll show you Bella. See, this is Bella, actually just a piece of cloth. Bella only becomes Bella when I put my arm and hand into her. Okay, so, um, let's put Felix back into character, just uh, to amuse ourselves a bit more. Okay, Felix, are you back with me? Yes, I am, but only because you are making my voice talk and you are making me move. Thank you for that, just to reinforce a point. Uh, one more thing about disabilities is for um, puppeteers. A puppeteer is somebody who makes a puppet move, so you can all be puppeteers very easily. A puppeteer who also uh, might have a limited range of movement. Lots of the puppets that we've been looking at require uh, hand and finger, arm movement coordination, what we call fine motor control, and gross motor control to make the puppets work. But this is not to say that um, I need this to be a puppeteer, absolutely not. If I did not have good fine motor control with my hands, doesn't matter because I can always find something that I can use. For example, a very simple puppet. Uh, and I can, even if I don't have fine motor control, I can find a way to hold the puppet in a different way. Yeah. Uh, I can work with someone who can help me to do that. I might be using my, my legs, other parts of my body, all sorts of ways that uh, people can be puppeteers. Do not be limited by disability, think rather this ability. What is it that I can do and include everyone? Felix, can you summarise the power of puppets and the sensitivities and things that we need to be aware of? OK. Uh, yes, of course, we had the number one. And this was be careful about representations of people and stories. Be careful and be careful kind. Okay. Change the names and change the stories a bit. Okay. Thank you, that was number one. What was number two? Number two was the long world beginning with S that was stereotypes. I like this word. Stereotypes we will not reinforce, we will not continue or perpetuate the stereotypes. Uh, we will be clever and we will turn them on their heads even while we respect 
some of the elements of the tradition of storytelling and puppeteering. That was number two. Number three was the people with disabilities. Some intellectual disabilities, we must be careful and we come out of character and we say Felix is just a piece of cloth. He's not real, he only exists when I'm with him and you can see how I move him. Thank you. And back into character. Uh, number four was anybody can be a puppeteer. One, two, three, four. It does not matter if you do not have the use so much of your fingers and your hands, you can find another way to do it and we welcome everyone. Ooh. So that was the power of puppets. Be careful, they're great for communicating but they do have a lot of power in the imagination. Uh, let's move on to some practicalities. Uh, maybe it's time to bring back Bella, what do you think? Yes, I will go and find her. Uh, Felix! Uh, yes, Bella, what is it? What can I do for you? Well, I think that you've been talking for too long and I'm feeling bored. So, I've decided I'm going to fast forward you so that we can get back to making some more puppets and having fun! Here's my remote control. Are you ready to be fast forwarded? Oh, I suppose so. Huh? The things I put up with. Uh, I must call my agent. Uh. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you, Bella, for fast forwarding uh, that little bit of boring, uh, more older children and adult talk. And tell us what uh, we're going to do now. Well, we're going to make another kind of puppet called a shadow puppet. Well, first, we need some more cardboard. Okay, well, that's good because we've still got some left from everything else that we were making yesterday. What else do we need? Well, you need a pen or a pencil. Okay. So I've got a pencil here. And then what? You need to decide what shape you want. For a shadow puppet, it is important to have a good, strong outline. And um, what happens if I'm not very good at drawing? No problem. We found a picture in the old newspaper. Okay. So, we like this because it's a very strong shape. It's a strong outline. We're going to cut around this and then copy it onto the cardboard. Okay, so I'm going to do that now then. Um, ask for help if you need using the scissors. I found this in a newspaper with Bella. Uh, if you wanted, you could also download uh, an image from the internet and if you have the facilities, you could print it off and then cut round it um, or just draw something yourself. I cut around our figure. Uh, you could just hold it and then with a the pencil, you could trace around it. But for shadow puppets, it's good if they are a dark color this figure is almost black anyway. I'm just going to stick it on like that and then cut round the whole thing and then just colour in the bits that need to be a bit darker. I've now cut out the shape which I glued on. Um, if you have black card you could uh, just draw straight onto the black card. I didn't have any black card. I had this old cereal box so we're just using what we have and I'm going to actually protect the table. Very important. I'm quickly going to make sure it's all nice and dark so it stands out better in our shadow theatre. Now we just need to put a holder on it. Um, again, use what you have. So I found a stick in the garden and I'm going to tape it to the back of his leg. 
If you don't have a stick, maybe you have uh, an old pencil or something. This is what it will look like when it's in a shadow theatre. Hey, who turned out all the lights? Don't worry, Bella. It's only me. I'm just setting up our shadow theatre. I have a torch and a piece of paper. This time it's not recycled paper um, because otherwise the words would show through. And I'm just going to show what our shadow puppet will look like. Our shadow puppet was actually quite effective, even though all I had was just a piece of white paper, the puppet and a torch. So I shut all the curtains, I blocked the light from the bottom of the door and I held the torch in my mouth like this and then I held the puppet between the torch and the paper. As you saw at the end, you can make the puppet appear bigger or smaller depending on how far away the puppet is from the paper. This is very simple. You could do this really, really big if you had um, a big sheet that um, you used with a light behind it and you could make the shapes yourself with your body or you could cut out some big shapes from big cardboard as well. You can find online instructions how to make a puppet theatre out of a box uh, where you leave a one centimetre border, cut out the rest of the back of the box, stick this on and then shine the light behind. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I actually have some young friends who have done a brilliant job already and we are going to have a quick look at uh, some child-led shadow puppet theatre. Nous allons vous conter l'histoire des trois petits cochons. Il était une fois une maman qui avait trois petits cochons et un jour, et un jour elle leur dit « Vous êtes assez grands et vous allez aller construire leur maison, votre maison. » Le premier petit cochon a cherché de la paille. Ils le ramenèrent assez vite. Après, assez... il construisit sa maison assez vite et il fut très fier de lui. Pendant, Pendant ce, ce temps, temps, le deuxième cochon trouva du bois. Ils le ramenèrent. Mais pas très loin de là, près de la maison du premier cochon, le loup arriva. Ouvre-moi Oh sinon, en un coup de souffle, je vais faire voler ta maison. Non, non, je ne t'ouvrirai pas. Tu es le méchant loup. Alors, alors je vais souffler sur ta maison. Et ta maison s'envolera. Hein? Go. Puis, le deuxième petit cochon arriva. Et il racontait sa, sa mauvaise situation. Je suis en danger. Mais pourquoi Mais parce que le patron de là, le loup m'a suivi et il m'a soufflé sur ma maison. Et ma maison s'est envolée. Puis, à part le trait, le loup arrive. Et il dit Ouvrez-moi Sinon, non, en un coup de souffle, je vous casse votre maison et votre maison s'envolera. Non, non Vous êtes le méchant loup on ne vous ouvrira pas. D'accord. Alors, je vais souffler, souffler sur votre maison et votre maison s'envolera. Ah ah Pendant ce temps, le dernier petit cochon alla chercher de la brique. Il alla construire sa maison tout en haut du chemin. du temps, mais c'est une belle maison solide. Pendant ce temps, les deux petits cochons arrivèrent. Top, 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 top. Grand frère, grand frère, ouvre-nous, le loup nous chasse. On est en danger. Entrez, entrez, petit frère. Go. 
Sur la pente des pieds, le loup arriva. Toc, 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 ouvre-moi la porte. Non, en un coup de souffle, je vous casse votre maison. Non, 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 non. méchant loup, nous ne t'ouvrirons pas. Alors le loup souffla sur la maison de tout son corps. Mais la maison ne se cassa pas. Alors le loup ressafla. Et encore. Et encore. Et encore. Et encore. Et encore. encore. Jusqu'à ne plus avoir de Après, ils décidèrent de, mon... de monter par la cheminée. Sauf que les petits cochons ont préparé une armée. Et dès que le loup tomba dans la cheminée, il se brûla les fesses. Puis ils ne voulurent plus jamais venir embêter les, petits co- les, les trois petits cochons. Puis les trois les petits, petits cochons, cochons dressèrent, dansèrent, tout en sang, tout en cœur. On a vaincu le loup, on a vaincu le loup. On a... Voici comment se termine notre conte. Wow, that was amazing. But I'm getting a bit tired now. Can we make some very, very simple puppets now, please? Another very simple puppet to make is one that we're going to put on our hand again. So you can use elastic if you have any. Uh, This is recycled. Measure around your hand so that the elastic is tight and add a little bit extra like that. I'm going to cut it and then I'm going to sew it together so that it becomes a band that I can put on and take off. Don't worry if you don't have any elastic, even not old stuff, you can use anything. You can use, this is an old shoelace that you will be able to tie around your hand, ask someone for help. I've sewed up my piece of elastic, just like this, and then I can turn it inside out. I also um, cut another piece of elastic in half this way to make a more narrow one because I thought this was actually quite thick. I can now put the elastic on my hand like that. We have to add some eyes now. If you have some ping pong balls then these are good because you can glue them on and these will become nice big eyes and then you can add some black dots in the middle. I don't have any ping pong balls and in case you don't then we need to think of an alternative. So I thought the most simple would be just to take a piece of paper, again it's recycled, already been used for something else, Uh, screw it up into a ball and then I'm going to stick these on my band for eyes. It's going to reuse the eyes that I made for something else. Okay. And there we have a very simple puppet. And it can have a long nose like this or a short nose like this. <laughs> what do you think? Huh? So I've decided if my cat wants to be in the film, uh, she should. Uh, experience some of the puppets so let's see what she makes of our bunraku <laughs> no reaction hello I'll try stroking oh yes oh that's good oh you like that yeah you like that yeah very good try a different puppet hey don't look now but there's a mouse behind you <laughs> Eek, eek, eek. Eek, eek, eek. <laughs> Not impressed by the mouse either. <laughs> We're going to explore 
how the different puppets can move and some of the things they can and can't do, which might help us when we come to write our stories and perform our puppet plays. Okay. So let's start with you, Bella. You are a glove or a hand puppet. We've also got our dog or wolf here, who's the same. So what are the good things about hand and glove puppets and what are the things that maybe are a little bit more difficult to do? I can talk and I like to talk and I like to sing as well. Um, and what about our wolf friend here? He's also a glove puppet, but he can't move his mouth the same way as you can. You know, so slightly different. But look at this difference. Yes, he can clap and move his arms. Uh, you can't because you don't have any arms. Yep, fair enough. Our wolf friend can also nod his head quite well. He can turn. You too. Mm. And he also, you can't see his feet, but he can move like you can as well. Uh, I think that these glove puppets are quite good at giving hugs. Oh, isn't that sweet? Oh, help, I can't breathe. Okay. <laughs> uh, so hugging and pushing and dancing with arms and jumping up and down a little bit. And Glove puppets with arms can also carry things. Okay, I'm going to carry the keyring puppet and give it to you and you can put it in your mouth. Although it always looks like you're eating something when you do that. The difference we have here, we can still talk, but I've got maybe a little bit more movement in my hand here to give expressions around the eyes and the mouth. We're going to try and always look at what the puppets can do rather than what they can't do. And don't be afraid to really explore. You may be used to with a, for example, a sock puppet just doing that, which is fine. But really explore what you can manage in terms of twisting, rolling, you know, stretching. So try and go a bit further with your movements than you might normally be used to. Make the most of your puppet possibilities. Now look at the difference between this frog, which is designed to be seen upright like that. There's a difference between the frog and, thank you Bella, the crocodile. If I just had the crocodile standing up, you would just see the crocodile's tummy. But to get the full effect of the crocodile, it's better that you see him like that. This one is obviously good at walking, dancing, hopping, jumping, but is best seen from the front. If you start to see the mouse from the side, because it's two-dimensional, that means it's flat, then you start to lose a bit of the fun. Uh, difference between our mouse, who's quite good at walking forwards, and our sheep with four fingers, who could actually be quite good at walking sideways. Froggy is a bit more three-dimensional so you can still see him from the side as well. We have our spoon puppet. And as we said, this might be useful for somebody uh, who is not so good with their fingers or hands. We could also have a different expression on the other side, where the spoon puppet was happy or sad, for example. Let's move to the key ring puppet, a new species of puppet that we've just invented doesn't have a mouth that can move like Bella. Nope. But I can get Keyring Puppet to walk. I can get the puppet to dance. <laughs> Pretty groovy moves there. And also because uh, he happens to have uh, a ring here, I could, uh, I could maybe have some fun getting him to fly. I think that would be a good use of uh, Keyring puppets abilities. Something tells me that 
Kieran puppet could also be quite a good acrobat. The good thing about our Bunraku puppet is that because it's made of very soft paper, he has a lot of flexibility in the limbs here. Our Bunraku puppet um, has some very nice expressive, yeah, leg arm movements, kind of nice kind of head flexibility, can bend forward, um, and the moth physical theatre um, do some nice explanations of how they can breathe like this. and they can turn. So these ones are really flexible, very, very nice. Even though you can't see a face, it still gives the impression very strongly of having a personality and a character. If you remember, we use this one with an arm here and uh, we can turn the head like this, lean it forwards and backwards. And of course, we've got this arm. So we can do quite a lot with this. Just needs practice and good to practice in a mirror as well for this one. Because you're using your arm, it's easier if I stay at the same level as the puppet. If I try to hide under the table, it becomes more difficult for me because I have uh, less room to move my arm. My arm is in a bit of an awkward position, so I'll just show you what I mean. And it's quite hard for me to hide myself completely. You see, I've lost a bit of motion. I've got a shorter range here with my hand compared to my whole arm. So that's something to, to think about. So this difference is that I'm going to hold the foot separately. And whereas with the, the other one, the mask one, I was using my whole arm a lot more. With this one, I think it looks a little bit better if I keep my wrist here and just have maybe a, a smaller motion like this. But the disadvantage of this one is that the head is quite heavy. So after a while, you might get tired holding this. And this is our string puppet. Now, these are much more complicated to operate and they need a lot more practice. So here he's standing up straight. You can see his arms are attached to a separate loop of string and his legs. If I pivot this up and down, his legs will move up and down as well. So with this one, I have the possibility that I can put the arms on the hook at the front and that leaves this hand free and he can walk. And if I want to move the arms higher, for example, then I can do that with my other hand. In theory, these puppets are good at walking and climbing things. There we go, get them to climb something. And of course, anything to do with flying. Yeah. But they don't have uh, the expressive mouth like Bella does, for example. So each puppet has different types of strengths. The limitations of this, you can see it's face on. It doesn't really help if we see it sideways. And you can only really get the full effect when you're in a dark room with the light behind it and a sheet of paper or of cloth. Uh, now, they can't move their arms and legs like Monsieur Seguin or like our mouse or our sheep. They don't move their mouths like Bella, but this has the advantage that you can have lots of characters. You could have lots of characters at the same time telling a whole story. The other advantage is that you use your imagination a lot with just seeing the outlines. This is good for fantasy, for fairy tales, uh, for creating even quite complicated shapes in outline that might be more difficult to do with, uh, with a live puppet. Also, the black and white shadow and light is really strong and effective. Another type of puppet is a rod puppet 
like those used in the ancient puppet art called Wayang Golek in Indonesia. In Indonesia, they also use rod puppets for special shadow puppets called Wayang Kulit. Another type of puppet we have is one that has um, a range of movements that are uh, already decided. So this little friend here, for example, we can wind him up. And he will move in a certain way, almost like a music box. As you can see, it's actually quite limited what he can do. There's also a range these days of uh, robotics and animatronics for puppets, as well as these more old fashioned uh, wind up versions. So, when you're telling stories with puppets, uh, you might want to start with a puppet that you've made, or you might want to start with the story and then create the puppets that best go with that based on their range of movement and the things that they do best. One thing we didn't talk about so far in relation to disability is that it's really good to show puppets that have disabilities as part of everyday life. To make our puppets more respective of uh, different types of uh, abilities, uh, I've now added a little hearing device for the mouse. I don't know what a mouse's uh, hearing device looks like, but this was just a, uh, a piece of uh, wire that I found. And uh, Spoon Puppet uh, now has visual impairment, so I cut out some dark glasses that I stuck behind and I found a white pencil, which could be a white cane which um, some people with visual impairments use to help get around. I managed to create a prosthetic replacement lower leg for our shadow puppet here. So we now have a range of uh, puppets with disabilities, but the important thing is that we don't carry on those stereotypes. Felix, can you please remind us what a stereotype is? But of course, a stereotype is a very, very simple view that lots of people have about something or someone, but which is not necessarily true. And we have to be careful here. On the one hand, we want to show positive images of the people and the animals and the spoons with disabilities. Um, we want to show that they can do lots and lots of things like everybody else, or they do things in a different way, maybe even a better way. But on the other hand, we don't want to show the opposite stereotype, which is that people with disabilities are always heroes. Or superhuman. So a good thing is just to show puppets with disabilities being part of the normal story. So we don't even need to draw attention to their disability, we just get used to seeing them, and that way we just show that having a disability is a normal part of life, like everybody else, yeah? Yes, I agree with this. I think it is a very, very good idea. So, Bella, we've talked a lot about puppets, different types of puppets, uh, the differences between them, but now I'd like to talk about stories, which is a big part of doing a puppet show. Do you like stories? Oh, yes. Do you like telling stories? Oh, yes, I love telling stories and making them up myself. Do you like hearing stories as well? Yes, I do. I like my favourite stories over and over again. For younger children, you can tell a story that you already know. So do you remember my young friends? They made their amazing shadow puppet theatre. Do you think you could do something like that? Oh, yes. This is um, a great example of uh, collaboration between adults and children different generations in the process of telling a story. So my young friends, they took the lead, they decided the story, they made the drawings to make the puppets, they made everything, they just needed a little bit of help uh, from mum with the cutting out of the uh, puppets 
and she also helped to when she was filming to give them a bit of directions like at one stage she said oh it needs to go a bit lower the puppet so that's a really nice way to get adults and children working together as part of the process of working with puppets and it's really good fun however if you're going to tell traditional stories remember to just think if you can change maybe a little bit if there are stereotypes involved. That means if there are things that uh, simplify the way that we look at people and that we want to change that a bit. And another thing we can do, do you remember we talked about uh, puppets with disabilities? Yeah, and we want to put these characters into our stories, but just show them as, uh, as normal characters like all of the others. So with younger children, um, it's really great, just adults and children working together, retelling simple stories, maybe with a little bit of a twist um, to update them a bit so that they're much fairer for everyone. This sounds really good. I can't wait to make my story. Okay, Bella, do you want to go and do that? You can work on that yourself while I speak to Felix for a bit. Um, with some of the older children and the adults, yeah? You want to go and start uh, making your puppet show and your story? Yes, I'll see you later. Bye. Good morning, Felix. How are you doing today? I am very, very well. I had an excellent breakfast and I am ready to get started. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, great. Um, today, you know, we're talking about um, stories that go with the puppets and they come together and um, we've just talked with Bella about how younger children can can work retelling stories that they're familiar with or making up their own simple ones but with you for the older children and adults I wanted to talk about how we can integrate important messages into our actual stories in the most effective way okay now yes this sounds very good I'm very interested to hear more about this I love stories ha 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 Felix, did you know that there's actually a really, really great tradition about using puppets to pass important messages? So that might be about health, how to eat properly. Uh, it might be about education, um, learning key skills like counting. <laughs> yes, that was a little uh, reference to Count Dracula from Sesame Street. Yes, I am a count. One, two, three. Yes. Uh, I digress. Um, so important messages and education um, and we saw earlier that you could use puppets to talk about difficult issues like violence. Uh, so whatever it is that you're trying to communicate, puppets are a great way to do it because, do you remember why? Oh yes, I remember. It is because it is an excellent cross between the information and the entertainment. Ho, ho, ho. Yes, that's right. So because of this great mix, the perfect puppet show, Felix, should not be able to tell the difference when you're receiving a message and having fun and being entertained. So we want to really integrate it so you can't see the difference. OK, sound good? Yes, it sounds good, but it also sounds a little bit of a challenge. I hope you all had a good breakfast too. <laughs> Felix, today we're not actually talking about uh, violence um, or how to properly wash your hands. We're actually going to talk about the theme of ACT Together, which is different generations, adults and children, playing, working and being better together for a just and sustainable world. What a fantastic goal! I love this project! I love this book. It's called Puppets with a Purpose, Using Puppetry for Social Change. Uh, it's by UNICEF but it was written in 1998 and I couldn't find it on the, uh, the internet. So I've uh, used some of the ideas from this book throughout this workshop. And if you get the chance ever to, to find this book, I really, really highly recommend it. It was based on an international workshop of amazing puppeteers from all around the world who came together in Indonesia back in the 1990s. We're going to use some top tips and golden rules from this book about how to develop your key messages and how to integrate them seamlessly into the entertainment of your puppet show. So thank you very much, UNICEF, uh, written by Peter McIntyre, 1998. Okay, Felix, are you ready to go? Oh yes, I'm ready. Okay, we're going to look at the golden rules of developing scripts or stories for puppet shows. 
from our UNICEF book. And the first one is what? The first one is that actions speak louder than words. This means you should show your messages rather than trying to just talk about them. This is the most important along with number one, two in the list of golden rules, which is you must blend the message into the story. You should not be uh, preaching and giving a lecture about what you want to explain. You should be showing, we should be, it should be, uh, how you say, very subtil, very subtle, that we cannot see the difference between the message and the entertainment. So this is number two. Okay, you repeat for me, what was number one? Um, number one was actions speak louder than words. Yep. Show, don't tell. Yes, very good. And what was number two? Uh, number two was to make sure that the message is seamlessly integrated. Yes, very good. You are paying attention. Okay, let us continue. Number three is to keep the language simple. Yes, this is number three. Keep it simple and related to the things that people already know. What's number four, Felix? Number one, two, three, four is to only have one main idea per show. Don't try to cram everything into one story. You will make it too complicated and you will miss your point. So one main idea for your story. What's number five? Number five is to have a particular audience in your mind when you are developing your story and your puppet show. For example, if we are talking about adults and children working together, maybe the audience is the school, the leaders of the school where the children spend a lot of time. Maybe we want to get more child participation here, working better with the adults. So I have to remember who is my audience, where do they start from, and how can I speak properly to them. Number six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh -huh. You think I can take the Count Dracula's job? <laughs> I think I will send in my CV. <laughs> yes, um, if we could just move away from your career development for a minute, Felix, and get back to the, the point. Number six. Yes, number six is you have to tell the how and the why, not just the what. So, in our example about the school, it is not enough just to say uh, we should have a better uh, group of children, like a school council, to make the decisions. We have to explain why this is important and how to do it. Yes. Number seven. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is to use the music. The music and the dancing. Yeah. Uh, you know I love to sing. <laughs> oh no, okay, I can see what's coming next, yeah. Uh, you're gonna give us a little French song? Oh yes. No, rien, rien. No, je ne regrette rien. Okay, why do we need to include music and dancing? Because it is fun! And you remember our audience, it depends on the age of our audience as to what music and what songs they would like best. Number eight. With our message, we have to promote things which are possible and which are not too unrealistic, otherwise the people will start to feel like they are disempowered, that they hear this great message but they cannot put it into practice. So, keep it practical. So, with the school council, it's pretty easy. Huh? We can give examples how to do this and this can be done. So, that is my golden rules from this UNICEF uh, great workshop that they held. And you, Marie, do you have any top tips to add? Uh, yes, Felix, I do. Thank you very much. So some additional top tips that were shared by these uh, amazing international puppeteers. Have a variety of characters and change the pace. So sometimes your story might be quick and sometimes it might be slow and reflective. Have a sense of humour, make people laugh, but make sure this is balanced against any serious messages. And here's an interesting one. Show how a problem is solved. Don't just focus all the time on the problem. So one person suggested that you should only spend 25%, that's a quarter of your time talking about the problem, spend 75%, that's 
thank you, three quarters on how the problem is resolved. In terms of the number of puppets on stage, they say usually you should have about a maximum of four puppets on stage or it gets too complicated and people don't know where to look. Yeah, I know, you're the only one at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make it interactive, especially if you're trying to, to communicate a message. So you can ask the audience questions. Uh, what do they think about things? What should uh, a puppet do next in a story? Uh, if you are using songs that uh, are well known, can you invite the audience to join in the songs? Another tip is to have good beginnings and endings for your story. This will make it very memorable. Respect the intelligence of the audience. So don't talk down to them. So remember you've got your audience in mind. Make sure you're speaking at their level. And then another tip was you can be inventive, creative, funny, serious, um, all in one puppet show. So really use your imaginations. Yeah, sound good. One other thing, we want to show that using puppets is fun, not just for children, but for adults as well. Moving, moving your body, moving, working with your body, uh, with your hands, uh, with your voice, uh, doing things, creating things together, whether it's stories or actual puppets, adults and children working together, it's really good fun. Yes, it is very important that you enjoy the process! Woo! There are great possibilities to work together with the adults and the children in both the process of developing the puppets and the stories and doing the performance and also in uh, getting the message of the adults and children working together into the actual story as well. Okay, what is next? Are we ready to actually perform our puppet show yet? Uh, not quite, just one more thing uh, to mention which is about the puppet characters. So we said um, be kind. Uh, and think carefully uh, so that they don't resemble too much any actual person. But in general, puppets work well if they have a slightly, don't listen, Felix, exaggerated character. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. We like uh, characters that we can recognize. Uh, we quite like the fact that Felix is a little bit naughty and the fact that he has some, uh, some faults. He's not perfect. So yes, he does accidentally go to the toilet with his microphone on. This makes him relatable. We can uh, imagine being uh, friends with you. Oh my goodness, yes. So make the characters uh, fun, a little bit exaggerated, but not cruel, and turn those stereotypes on their head. So yes, let's talk about uh, actual performances now. So you've got your puppets, uh, they fit the, the script, so you might start with the puppets or you might start with the story and then uh, match them all together. And um, the puppeteer uh, has to be familiar with the, the script and the aims. Then you practice, really important. But there will be a difference. Are you going to perform this puppet show live uh, with uh, an audience sitting in front of you, or are you going to record it like we're recording now, okay, on video? And uh, these days, uh, recording something and putting it on the internet uh, and sharing it via social media is, is actually uh, very common. So let's talk first about live performances. This is fantastic, the live performance. You cannot replace the smell of the crowd and the roar of the grease paint or something like that. Yeah, I love it. It's a lot of adrenaline, you know, you have to be really ready, good practice, working as a team. I love it. Yeah, it's great. Um, yes, um, any other benefits of doing a live performance? It will be very memorable and you have the opportunity as well at the end of the performance to have the questions and answers with the audience. So if they want to say, I really like this idea about working in the school better between the adults and children, but I want to ask some more questions. So this is ideal because you get more interaction. I think there might be a difference if you're doing it in your home or if you're doing it in your community or village. And part of that would be how many people would be in your audience. If you're doing it at home, then this kind of uh, small scale uh, puppets work. If Felix and I were on a stage or in a really big space, you wouldn't be able to see Felix's uh, movements and expressions because he would be too small. 
So we haven't talked about much larger puppets, um, but you can get really big puppets, carnival puppets, that, that people use their whole bodies to move. And the bunraku, Japanese puppets, uh, also are, are quite large as well and good for this. Otherwise, it might be a question of um, filming a smaller scale puppet, but having it live projected onto a big screen. So these are all important things to think about. Uh, more things to say about live performances it needs to be really well rehearsed. Oh, yes. Um, especially the entrances and exits of the puppets. You need to think about the time of day that you're doing it. Are you doing it in broad daylight? Can people see? Will you, people have the sun in their eyes? Practical considerations. Uh, are you doing it at night? Maybe that's an easier time for in the evening for people to get together, but then you're going to have to think about lighting. How are people going to see you? So a range of practical considerations to take into account if you are performing live. Something that applies to both live and recorded is um, how do you need to be hidden? So I'm hiding behind a table here with Felix, so you can't see so much what I'm doing. Um, if you have puppets where you want to be completely hidden, again, you need to hide behind something and you'll need to practice this. If you're hiding behind something, it needs to be comfortable. So I'm actually kneeling down and the floor is hard, so I've put down uh, my yoga mat, actually, just to make it easier. Uh, if you don't have a table, you could have a screen, some kind of a sheet or blanket, so anything that, that hides uh, the puppeteer a little bit to keep the magic, the magic of the make-believe fantasy world of puppets alive. Um, and also, you need to be comfortable if you are behind something and you have your, your arm up a lot. How long can you sustain that without getting tired? These things need to be considered, especially if you're doing it live. So again, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Some last points about uh, live performances, um, in particular about the audience. How are you going to invite them? Uh, how can you pick the right place, the right time of day to get maximum participation? And also follow up. So it is possible that by hearing and listening and seeing and enjoying to an, one amazing puppet performance that you might change people's minds about how great it is for adults and children to work together. Um, but uh, very often it's quite difficult for us to really change our behaviour after just listening and hearing to something once. So how can we reinforce this? So you've done your puppet show, yeah. Felix has been the star on the stage, for example, yeah. <laughs> uh, how can you follow it up? How can you share extra resources, um, have an interactive question and answer session with the audience, make resources available afterwards, longer term, do a repeat performance, maybe come back to the same place, uh, possibly using uh, the same or different puppets with kind of like the next stage of the story, uh, see how people have implemented what you've been talking about in terms of change. So think about this within the context of longer behavioural change and attitudinal change that you're trying to influence. Yes, it's a lot of fun to do one puppet show, but if we really want to make a difference, how can we build on that by working together as a team? And if you're recording, I've had to spend quite a long time testing uh, what you can see in the frame, whether it should be a wider angle because I'm making something, uh, or whether it can be a smaller, narrower focus like this, so the puppet appears larger. Uh, they do say that for videos that the puppets should fill two-thirds of the screen, which is actually quite large, so those are things to consider. So, uh, anything more about um, video, Felix? Well, yes, obviously the makeup is very important. I mean, is my nose shiny right now? Uh, no, it looks good to me. Uh, maybe just tweak your ear again. There we go. Uh, yeah, so... Puppets being used on film, be careful about the light. Maybe try to avoid uh, shiny, glossy paint that might reflect off uh, and distract. Uh, think about your background, is that distracting? Can you easily see the puppets? You might find it good to actually have a plain background or a sheet behind so that the puppets really stand out. Who's doing the filming? 
So I'm filming this with a tripod uh, because I'm doing it by myself, which is actually a bit tricky because I have to keep going backwards and forwards behind the camera to make sure um, that everything is visible and that it's all working well. Uh, if I had somebody to help me, then they could move around so we could have more of a dynamic view. We could look down on Felix, we could look up, look up Felix's nose, we could be much more dynamic. Um, so again, really great with adults and children working together, taking it in turns behind and in front of the camera with the puppets, really, really great. Good to practice in front of a mirror as well, uh, because I can't see right now exactly what Felix looks like. At one stage, when I started to use the, the glove element, putting my hand into Felix's back, oh, oh yes, it tickles, oh, uh, <laughs> then I realised when I looked at the video that the body had become a little bit twisted here and I couldn't see that. Another thing about performance is if you, the puppeteer, are visible, so I'm having a dialogue with Felix now, uh, so it's different compared to if I was hidden, uh, where am I looking? So in theory, if I'm talking to you, I'm trying to look more at the camera, but when Felix is talking or when I'm talking to Felix, I try to remember to look at Felix so that I'm not distracting your attention. Um, for example, you see Felix is talking now and I am not looking, Marie is not looking at the camera, she is looking at me. <laughs> and that is the way it should be. So we're trying to imagine that I'm seeing the world through Felix's eyes to try and create that connection with you, um, the audience. And if I've forgotten, which I'm sure I have, in the course of this uh, workshop, please forgive me. Uh, any more last minute things on performance, Felix? Yes, I want to remind you to have ready any music that you want to play and uh, where you are doing it. You might need uh, some loudspeakers, you might need to, to make it louder and the same for uh, the voice as well. So yes, uh, we are using the little uh, microphone here but you may not have this, so very important uh, either for uh, the live performance or the recording, can we actually hear what the puppets are saying? Otherwise it is a bit of a shame, so you should practice this. Lighting, uh, make sure that the lighting is uh, clear, can you see? Uh, is the light coming from behind? This can be difficult, unless it is of course for the shadow puppet, but this is something special. So, my puppet friends, thank you very, very much for your time and your energy helping me to present this workshop. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed it and found it useful, and we really hope that you go and have some fun uh, with adults and children working together, sharing messages so that we can make the world a better place through puppets. If you do make an amazing uh, puppet show, uh, about this theme, please do feel free to share it on social media with the hashtag WeActTogether. Bye! Uh, rubbish. So, this is a... <laughs> no, I'm speaking now, not you. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, Bella. Uh, now we're going to shout at the dog. Uh, excuse me, I think I have a little problem with my ear. Can you please... Uh, uh... Oh, oh yes, that is uh, much better, thank you, yes. Yes, it's the antlers. This is why I found this one very cute online. Two little wooden clothes pegs. Reindeer, oh sorry. <laughs> if I wind him up at the back. And let him go. <laughs> he falls flat on his face. <laughs> Yay! Um, you forgot the French accent there. Yes! Not allowed to swear. Yes, you said a naughty word. This is not good. We will have to edit this out. Absolutely right, Felix. I'm sorry. 
If you can't do everything yourself, it's very important to work in partnership. This is my puppet assistant. As you can see, um, he has really got a firm grip on things, really getting his uh, teeth into the problem. Thanks, Felix. Thanks for explaining that possibly better than I did. Uh, it's good to have an assistant at times like this. Indeed it is, especially when the assistant is me. We hope you had fun. We did. I didn't.